Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I know today's Thursday, the last day. Everybody's recovering from the parties and the being in Vegas and enjoying yourself. So I really appreciate you coming to this session. This session is SPC 147, Mastering App for Office Development. Today, what we're going to do, we're going to walk through essentially apps for office. We're going to go through the different types of shapes that exist within App for Office, walk through some examples in terms of the application of App for Office. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper in terms of the fundamentals around how the Apps for Office um, framework actually works and lights up within the Office application suites. We'll do some demos. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Visual Studio. Hopefully you guys aren't tired of Visual Studio yet. Uh, I would be gentle knowing today is Thursday and you're all ready to go home. So I'm hoping to leave you with just the right amount of information to get you familiar with Apps for Office, um, help you avoid some of the roadblocks, and hopefully get you excited about the technology. So let's go ahead and get started. So here's the agenda. I briefly walked through it. We're going to talk about the office development landscape. Um, Apps for Office provide a pretty compelling opportunity that I want to make sure you in the room understand it well enough so you can think about the different types of solutions that can be built. Next, we'll talk about the App for Office manifest. The manifest is a very important key piece of technology for the discoverability for Apps for Office. When you look at applications, essentially, that run today that were built around um, Office, they were Visto applications, and they lived on the client machine. So when you had to reach out and make changes to them, you were responsible for touching that machine to update the application that's associated with it. We're going to talk about how the app manifests, uh, provides you with the capabilities. You don't have to run into those issues anymore. You can do touch-free upgrades across your documents and your applications that are running on the client. So the app manifest becomes key to ensuring that you can make sure that your application is provisioned, discoverable, and deployed out to the um, Office application suite um, when the end user activates it. Next, we're going to talk about Office user experience. We're going to walk through, essentially, how the Apps for Office light up, what that light up experience is like. We're going to walk through some pitfalls that you want to try to avoid. Uh, additionally, we're going to close out in talking about some of the key pieces an application developer needs to be concerned about when they're building experiences within Apps for Office. And lastly, we're going to cover some scenarios. This is where we essentially take everything, put it together, and walk you through some scenarios that I've built, some scenarios that have been deployed out into the customer. Pause on this slide for a quick second. I realize. I'm on my last day, too, and I didn't introduce myself. My name is Ali Powell. I am a principal consultant with Microsoft Consulting Services. Uh, I've been working with Apps for Office uh, for just over a year now when it was codename Agaves, which is an interesting codename. Um, I've been developing some Apps for Office and going around training folks and building solutions. Uh, the biggest solution I've built has been at Boeing, specifically with the technology. So let's talk about where we're going. And before we do that, let me just get a quick vote. Who in the room has not heard the word apps yet? OK. So you're all ready. I'm going to be using the word apps more than you probably want me to. But I'm going to tie it to apps for Office. There are apps for SharePoint. There's apps for everything else. We are loving the term app at Microsoft. So um, when I'm talking about apps in the context of this presentation, I'll be talking about apps as they apply to Office. So when we look at the impacts in terms of what the landscape looks like for applications to be built, really, I like to set the perspective this way. If you think about any pervasive application that exists on the marketplace now, outside from a web browser, Office is that suite of applications. Office applications live throughout the enterprise. They travel outside the enterprise. And they deliver business value to organizations throughout the world. And when we look at that and the trends in terms of where that's going, having the capability to access and collaborate across the streams of devices that exist is becoming key. If you look at just the proliferation of the amount of devices that are being deployed, by 2016, you can just imagine 1 billion devices that exists. And we need to make sure there's an office experience on those devices, as well as extending that office experience to take advantage of the new app platform that developers are leveraging to build solutions. Next, you look at social networking. 
across the plethora of how people interact with each other. It is short, small bites of information. And we're building applications to help us digest that information in a much smaller, more optimized way. Lastly, applications and enterprises are moving to the cloud. Taking advantage of that, you need to make sure you have solutions that support the delivery of your application running on a platform that's a cloud OS. And just to clarify what I mean by cloud here, it's not necessarily just um, identifying the cloud as some space that we go pull functionality from, but the cloud as an OS, as truly a layer where you can deploy your applications to and not necessarily be concerned about scale out or be concerned about some of the critical components you need to take advantage of when your app is running for a solution for a user. When we look at the scenarios, devices become key. Devices are really going to be the key way that you deliver experiences to end users in the next generation of applications that we deliver. And those devices are going to support a variety of different input mechanisms. Predominantly now, touch. I have a nine-year-old son, and I have a five-year-old son, and my nine-year-old son looks for a mouse every time he walks up to a computer. My five-year-old son, he wants to touch everything even though it's not touch at all. But that's essentially the types of um, input mechanisms our applications are going to be facing when we're building them, not only for consumers, but also within the enterprise. So we need to make sure the applications that we build are acknowledge the mechanism that end users provide input to them. Next, we look at the cloud, how we're developing within the cloud. Applications now essentially are composite applications that take advantage of services that have already been deployed. What I find very interesting about the apps that have been developed in the last five or six years is every application isn't just an app itself anymore. It is an API and a platform. And that seems to be the case more and more based on the applications that we build. So when we look at the cloud, we're not only delivering finished solutions to the end user, we're deploying APIs that we version and manage as well for other consumers to take advantage of. And lastly, socially, we need to make sure our applications provide the mechanisms for end users to reach into their social networks and tap that as a means for them to have the capability to bring that information into your app and extend the experience not only with the end user who downloaded the app, but other end users who might be in your social network. So we'll look at some examples around how Apps for Office can help extend that, as well as adorn your social network to provide you the capabilities to share that functionality throughout the enterprise or on the internet. I went to a Steve Ballmer. I was one of the lucky ones to be in the room when Steve Ballmer stood on stage and he just said, developers, 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 and he did that for I don't know, five minutes, you know how he does stuff and he gets really excited. But now when you look at things now, it's really about the devices. Same D, but different word. Devices are going to become key in terms of the next applications that you deliver. And we see that on two fronts. The BYOB, bring your own device, is becoming a very important thing for IT organizations within enterprises to consider as well as consumers. Consumers typically now have more than one device, one computing device, that they use more than 20% of the time throughout the day, be it their phone or their authoring device, which might be a laptop, a tablet, or a PC. These seem to be the primary means that end users are interacting with applications. So the new applications that we build have to have the capability to take advantage of those devices regardless of the means or the spectrum the end user crosses when they're consuming it. There's that word again. Apps are everywhere. You've probably heard the word app a thousand times since you've been at the SharePoint conference. Apps are becoming the primary way that functionality is being delivered to end users, but they're changing the paradigm in terms of how we build applications. If you think about the applications we used to develop, develop, excuse me, those applications were composite applications. They had a lot of breadth. They would cover a substantial amount of functionality that we would try to deliver across tabs, across different screens. We would try to do that within the applications in the past. Apps today essentially give you the capability to produce transacted solutions 
that essentially take the end user from one end to the one end in a very scripted, well-defined manner. So we're building transactional applications that have the capability to start a end user at some known point and end them at some deterministic point at the very end. So apps are being somewhat laser focused in terms of the functionality that they deliver. It changes our paradigm. We're accustomed to building applications across different scenarios to solve different solutions, which means our life cycle for building applications is going to shrink. No long will you have the projects that go for 18 and 36 months. The opportunity to develop apps and the true value of developing apps on a platform give you the capability to very quickly and efficiently spin out applications and incrementally add that functionality as you grow it. So we'll walk through some examples of how Apps for Office give you the capability to do that. So let's think about it for a second. Only because this slide took me a long time to produce. No, but really, if you look at the new paradigm for solutions, really solutions now that we're building tie to personas. Those personas have a responsibility to try to meet some objective within your solution. And they use devices. These devices consume the solutions that we develop on a daily basis. The majority of most of the solutions that, be, that are being built today take advantage of services because composition for application development is becoming a key factor to accelerate delivery moving on. And lastly, those services run on infrastructure. And what we're finding more and more is that infrastructure needs to become infrastructure that's flexible, that's infrastructure that we can run on-prem, that's infrastructure that we can run in the cloud or in some hybrid manner. So having the capability to build apps that provide solutions based on this paradigm will be key for the next type of work that we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. Question. So the question was, why did you use the word persona? Great question. So the reason why I chose the word persona is when you're looking at applications, you want to tie applications to a very specific themed user. So for example, um, personas became key in the Chase banking app that we built for Windows Phone 8. We had very specific users that we wanted to target to solve those transactions for. For example, there is the power user that Chase considered the person who goes into the branch three or four times a week. There was the user that was the light user, and there was the college user. Those were all Chase customers, but we gave them different personas with different names so we can identify what the objectives they wanted to accomplish. Even though they all wanted to take a picture of a check, they wanted to do it in a variety of different ways, and they wanted to accomplish it in a different means. So personas give you that ability to not look at just a single user, within your enterprise, you can look at various types of users and identify with them and tie objectives to them. Did I answer the question? So when we look at Apps for Office, let's talk about essentially what they are. So Apps for Office essentially give you the ability to acquire applications and bring the web into the Office platform. That's it. I can show you really neat pictures, but if you leave with anything today, Apps for Office give you the ability to bring the web into Outlook, into Excel, into Word, into PowerPoint, into Project. And having the capability to bring that web into those solutions now, I can develop that web application on whatever technology seems fit for the solution that I'm building. So I'm no longer tied to a very specific set of technology to meet the business objective. That web server can be running any technology I choose that's going to accelerate delivery. Or it could acquire services from um, cloud applications on any technology that they choose to fit, as long as we have some lingua franca we can use to exchange data. And typically, that's using JSON. So when we talk about Apps for Office, they essentially give you the ability to, to take loosely coupled services, bring them into Office, and arrange them and have them interact with documents that are hosted by the Office runtime. And those applications can be built using HTML, JavaScript, and CSS3. And you can use whatever interaction technology you choose. Primarily, people are using JavaScript. But if you wanted to do interactive technology on the server side, you could use ASP.NET 
Ruby on Rails, it's completely your choice. There's also an example I have if we get to it that I just use Node.js to build it. So that really frees you to have the capability to choose exactly what technology you want to um, consume that's gonna best accelerate the delivery of the solution you're building. Next, they're end user focused and they're context sensitive. That's really important. Um, if you think about how office applications work, generally we're opening up an office application in the context of a document or we're opening up an office application in the context of receiving a new email or a meeting alert or Excel workbook. They are context sensitive and they're user focused. So the applications that you build have to adorn and live in that type of paradigm to help accelerate the end user's ability to get used to the application that you built and thus leverage the APIs that are gonna be made available. Lastly, because you get the capability of building an app, we have an app store or a catalog where those applications are acquired from. So Microsoft hosts the Office Store. The Office Store is a location where you can publish your application for public end users to acquire access to them. Secondly, there are catalogs that can live on premise, and those catalogs can live in SharePoint, or they could just be on a file share. So the acquisition process of an app comes from a notion of a catalog, and there's two catalogs that exist, the Office Store or the on-premise. Secondly, once that application is acquired from that catalog, it gets activated on a device. And that device could be a desktop device, that device could be a tablet device, that device could be a mobile device. It's completely flexible. But the activation of the app for Office always happens on the device. And we'll walk through what kind of breadcrumbs get left on the device so you can have a clear understanding in terms of what is actually installed on the physical machine. We'll drill into that shortly. So the one, two, three model, what are apps for Office? First and foremost, they're manifest-driven applications. The manifest gives you the ability to essentially assert or declare what type of capabilities your application offers and it gives you the ability to associate an application to a document that might be hosted by the Office platform. Two, they're just HTML, JavaScript, and uh, CSS3. That's all apps for Office are. And three, they have to be delivered to a consumer via some HTTP-based mechanism. And that can be any HTTP-based server you choose. So we have the capability to acquire the manifest from some catalog, you have the ability to serve up the functionality within the application. And three, we have the ability to acquire that functionality from some HTTP-based server. When we drill in a little bit closer, we look at an app for Office and we see it really being the manifest, the delivery of a web page to the Office application. That is an actual app for Office. The nice part about this, which separates this from Visto apps, just a quick question, how many Visto developers in the room? Don't be ashamed, I'm one too. All right, now, let me ask this question. How many people have developed web applications in the room before, using HTML, JavaScript? That is the biggest difference between the two technologies. One thing to clarify, Apps for Office do not replace Visto applications, just to clarify that, they don't at all. Apps for Office give you the ability to develop against some canonical API that'll work regardless of the device that the application is actually running on. And you write against this notion of a document, which we'll look at in a second. Visto has very specific interfaces. They have very specific impl and versions that are tied to the version of the Office application that's running on the client. So you're intimately aware of the exposed functionality by the hosting Office product that you might be targeting. For Apps for Office, you're not necessarily tied to the specific version of the Office application. You're tied to the JSON API that you'll code against that'll give you the ability to leverage the functionality that you want. So now that we understand what they are, let's have a conversation about how they look. Apps for Office take on three key shapes. These are really the application types. The first is a task pane. And we've seen this before if you brought up the thesaurus or if you look for any synonyms uh, while using Word or you're using spell check which connects to Bing. 
we're accustomed to looking at the task pane types of applications. So a task pane app lives on the, can be docked on the right hand side, or the left hand side of the office client, and you have the ability to interact with the document that way. The next one is a content app. A content app is akin to a chart that exists within Excel. And content applications give you the ability to have some connectivity, a binding to data that exists within Excel that your web application running on your server can receive that data and produce whatever HTTP interface you choose, HTML interface you choose, excuse me. And content apps are rimless. Uh, we'll see that they lack the Chrome that a normal task pane application does, so you can um, embed them within Excel spreadsheets, save that spreadsheet, send that spreadsheet to a colleague across the world. He or she could open that up, and they can interact with that application. The third one is a mail app. And to me, these are going to be the most compelling applications that get built, because um, Outlook seems to be a terminant resident program that runs on my machine all day long, and I'm constantly interacting with it. So solutions that have the capability to contextually interact with inbound information into my mailbox or me interacting with appointments will help accelerate my day. Mail applications run within Outlook, and that's Outlook running on the client as well as OA that runs out on the web, as well as the mobile version. So you'll have the capability to build applications that interact essentially with the context the user is interacting with in Outlook and participate with accessing the data within the message, participating with interacting with other items within the message. You'll also have the capability to make Exchange Web Services call to call back into Exchange to act on behalf of that user from your application. It's round this out and look really about the framework. So how is all this accomplished? And what's the difference between this and a Visto application? So the first and foremost, Apps for Office run on something called the Web Extensions Framework, or WEF. And WEF exists essentially to give you a hosted environment that will give your application the ability to interact with the Office document that's opened on the end user's uh, desktop or on their mobile device. And it, that's done via a JavaScript API known as the Office JSON or the Office JavaScript object model. Once that object model exists, it gives you access to a basic set of services that your application can interact with. Then there are application-specific uh, JSON that exist. These exist to give you the ability to um, interact with specific versions of an app. For example, there's one built for Outlook. So with an Outlook, as items arrive, you might want to know um, what type of item landed on the inbox and interact with that item. There's a distinction between appointments. There's a distinction between mail items. There's a distinction between inbound items that are sent on the server that you can participate with. And then you have app APIs. And your app APIs essentially augment the capabilities that exist within the JSON API so you can build your application for the functionality that's going to target the user. This is true regardless of the symmetry of where the application is activated from, whether it's the rich client office applications or it's a web browser. The web browsers target a very specific web browser. They have to be ECMAScript compliant. Um, and we'll walk through the different versions of the browsers that are supported. Yes, question. Yep, so th the question was an application, an app for Office that I develop, can it run on the client as well as in the web, the same app that I write? Yes, it can. The rationale for that is if you look at the applications that are being built now, there's a runtime hosting environment. And that runtime host environment gives you a set of APIs that you can interact with. In this scenario, it's the Office JSON. So because you interact with the Office JSON, regardless of the host that's running the application, you'll have the capability to write it once and run it across many devices. Yep. All right, let's jump into some code. First and foremost, we're going to deal with just looking at a standard app manifest. If you understand the manifest, you will understand 95% of every type of app for Office that can be developed. 
The only thing left is the API. Um, so when we look at an app manifest, we, we see three important pieces of information. The first one is the app type. The app type, as I pointed out earlier, tells you the shape of the application uh, that you want activated within the office um, environment when your app gets activated by the end user. The next critical piece of information is we'll never get away from GUIDs because they're great. So you have a GUID that uniquely identifies your um, app for office such that when it's deployed to the store or within your enterprise, that's going to be the glue that binds your app to the actual document or mailbox item that it's associated with. So that becomes very key. Also, since we're in a mastering class, and when all you guys walk out of here, you will be masters, is the ID is what you use as the service point for upgrading your apps in the future. So I'll show you an example of that later on. So the good becomes really important for identity as well as servicing in the future. Next, we have a version. We have a title. I just put the SharePoint conference title. We're going to use a locale of English in the US. Uh, I want to see if you guys seen a more impressive demo than this one. Uh, we have app domains, which we'll cover a little bit later. You have capabilities. Capabilities give you the ability to say, my application that I'm building is dependent on a set of functionality that I expect to be within the host. So if you look at an office application as a host, a host must have the ability to assert capabilities that my app can take advantage of. So here I'm saying that I require that the capabilities made available by the host be document and workbook. And we'll look at an example of how those are used. Lastly, this is the most important piece of information that exists within the app manifest. That essentially tells the app for office runtime which URL it should load when your application lights up within office. That can be a local URL, that can be a remote URL, it's completely your choice. In this example, I'm just pointing directly to Wikipedia. And last, but certainly not least, is the read write document. And the read write document gives you the ability to assert the type of permissions you would like to have provided to your application when that document gets activated within your app. So read write essentially says, I'm going to interact with the document, not only reading information, but of course writing. I love that description. OK. So this is my app for Office. Let's do something that's going to make you all masters. One important thing to recognize, when you're building an app for Office, an app for Office needs to have a location where it can find apps. So when I light up Word, and I go to try to add an app to Word, Word's going to say, where is a catalog that I can look to find applications? A catalog is essentially a location where app manifest lives that Office will discover and light up to let the end user activate within their um, Office application. So here, an important key to note if you're doing development not in Visual Studio, but um, within the registry, HKEY HICKEY current user, under software, Microsoft, Office 15, you will see a folder called WEF for the Web Extensions Framework. Within there, you'll see a folder called developer. And the developer folder is a key folder because as you're doing your development and you're round tripping, you want to have a really convenient way for you to deploy apps so you can discover them in the various Office clients that are running on the um, end user's machine. So by placing a key, a string key within this location, we can spin up Word and it'll find it. So we'll just say my app. I'm going to go here, and I have a folder, my really impressive demo XML file. Let's copy that. So all I've done, I've dragged this over, as you can see it. All I've done is I created just a key within my registry under the developer tab that essentially will allow 
any Office app that I run now will find that application and load it. So let's test that. Load Word. Click a blank document. I'm going to go to Insert. Under Insert, now you see this nice little logo that says Apps for Office. See here, it found my really impressive demo. When I click Load, You can see here, it just loaded right in the task pane the Wikipedia website. That was my first application that I've deployed. I didn't write any code at all. I pointed to an existing web app that I wanted to bring into Office. I didn't deploy any code onto the remote machine. Hint, hint, this is because it's the development machine. But once I had access to that catalog, I essentially word knew where that catalog was at because I've added it to the registry. It found the applications that were trusted within that catalog, and it let me add them to the document. That's how you acquire an app for Office. That's how you activate an app for Office within an Office client. That's essentially it. We didn't write any code whatsoever, so you have the capability to build these manifests now to point them to existing web applications that you probably have already built within the enterprise and leverage them within the Office app. So that was fun, but let's do something a little bit more fun. Let's close this. And let's try the experience from Visual Studio. I'll show you this. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio and spin up a new Visual Studio project. And here, we're just going to start Visual Studio. I'm going to go to a new project. I'm going to create a new app for Office. Let's just call it uh, OK. And I'm going to name it that. OK. I'm going to target Excel this time. Click Finish. And now, with the Visual Studio tooling, it's Plum gives me the ability to walk through a wizard where I click on a new project, I say I want to build a new app for Office, then within App for Office it gave me the dialog that says what type of capabilities does your application require and what type of app do you want to develop or what shape do you want your app to be. So now that I've built that, I'm going to go ahead and open up the manifest file here. And you see we have the same manifest file that exists. If anyone can't see that, let me know. I will zoom in to make things clear. OK, everyone seems to be OK. So here we have the app manifest. When we scroll over to the right, we can see it's a task pane app, which is what I selected. We populate it with some default information. And here it's pointing to this URL. I'm going to make this one point to Wikipedia as well, because I like Wikipedia. I'm going to save that. Now I'm going to hit the Start button. But before I do that, I want to show you what happens in the registry. So if we see here in the registry, I'm refreshing. There are no entries under the Developer folder. When I hit F5, it started within Excel. It's loading my app for Office. And it's loaded here. We can see Wikipedia is loaded here within the task pane. But if I go back and look at the registry and hit F5, all Visual Studio does under the covers for you as you're building your apps for Office and you're round tripping from an F5 perspective is creating an entry within that folder so Office knows to trust those apps and activate them um, when it loads up the initial runtime document. So that's the Visual Studio experience. Let's go back. So we just quickly just looked at the app manifest. All we did, we created an XML file. We pointed that XML file to tell it the type of app we wanted. We gave it some identity information that it can easily be found within the Office client. We pointed it to the web application that's going to host our functionality. And we fired up the Office client, and we activated it on a document. That's all we did within the app manifest, and the end user was able to acquire that Office app. 
So there's an Agile manifesto. We will now have an App for Office manifesto. Let's talk about the App for Office manifest. There are four key pieces of information that you always want to make sure when you're building an App for Office are covered. The first one is going to be consumption declaration. Consumption declaration means that you need to make sure you've identified the capabilities your application is going to be dependent upon, and you identified and selected the type of app that you want deployed. The rationale for that is a content app can't become a task pane app. Once it's been deployed and activated on the Office client and lives with the document, you can't change the shape of the application once it's associated with the doc. So consumption declaration forces you to think about the shape or the type of application you want built and the capabilities that must be made available within the host when you're building your app. Secondly, you want to make sure you've identified service consumption. Applications we build today acquire services from some remote location. That's done in a variety of different ways using Ajax. And when we know we need to acquire services from some foreign domain, that's a domain that's not hosting our application, there is a variety of different patterns and techniques that you can follow using cores, using JSONP. But it's very important that you assert the type of service um, clients and points you're going to consume. And we'll look at an example of that. That's done via one notion within an app for Office. If I'm going to point to information or to links on another website, I use what's called an app domain. So for those that are familiar with .NET, you have app domains as a shield, the context of your .NET application running. App domains and the notion of an app for Office give you this ability to acquire information or functionality from an application that's not hosted by your native app. Third piece is the aesthetic design. This is the hardest part for me. Hopefully you guys don't struggle with this. Um, but the aesthetic design becomes an important piece because you need to be able to do two key things to have your app get discovered. Um, let me give you a backstory first. I am a big person. I only install applications on my phone if the reviews are greater than four and it has three stars. I don't care what it does. What has to be a good app. Uh, but if it has three reviews and three stars, I will always install it. I will just give it a run. It, it's amazing how many apps I have on my phone. That identity that exists within your app manifest is associated with those recommendations and the information that's stored in the store, whether that store is public, hosted by Microsoft, or it's internal, hosted on a SharePoint. You'll have the capability to associate reviews and context information with your application. So, Associate a icon URL that we'll look at in an app manifest gives your app the ability when it lights up within Office to have a really nice, rich, um, cute little visual association to your app. I, that's how I can describe it. You can tell I'm challenged with cute things. So, but it, it's, it becomes really key because that becomes essentially the graphic that's going to be the identity for your application throughout the enterprise. It's going to be your identity for your app in the Office Store. And as we see, when documents move throughout the world on the internet or as you walk your um, machine from place to place, it becomes the identity that's associated with your application in general locally on that end user's machine. So the Office, the Visual Studio templates don't add that icon. But when I show you and we drill into a, a different app manifest, take the time to assert the icon URL with your application. That makes a really big difference in terms of the end user's experience with your app. Let's look at one. I am going to open up now an application. This would have been great a week and a half ago, but uh, however the result. This application is an election tracker. It is an app for Office that's running in Excel. I acquired the application from the Office Store. I'll walk you through it. Once I acquired that app, it came down as an Excel template. When I opened up that template file, it rendered this contextual view. 
So I'm going to zoom out so you can see most of it. This is an app when I right click on it, view source. As you can see here, it's just an HTML application that's running within Excel that's hosted by Excel and it's coming from a website that's hosted on Windows Azure. So we're just looking at standard HTML within this view. But as I scroll over the content within the view, you can see that the application is interacting with my mouse uh, hover and interacting with not only the website, but my Excel document. And I'll show you the information behind it. So if we look behind here, this is an Excel spreadsheet that shows the precincts reporting and what they, um, where the vote went for a given user within that precinct. And we can see that across the presidential election as well as the Senate elections. And various polls that had been taken leading up to a certain date and time. This is all content that exists within the spreadsheet. My map that you see here is reading that information that's in the spreadsheet and rendering this heat map to display information when the end user mouse is over it. So this is all coming from the actual spreadsheet. So as I scroll and move things, we can go back in history to look at the interaction of how people projected the elections were going to end up. So this is my app interacting with data within the spreadsheet across these rows and columns that are bound to it, producing a really rich user interface that the end user can interact with. This is running directly on my desktop, but we're going to do something really interesting with this app. I'm going to save as my computer. I'm going to demo to, we'll call it live. So I've just saved the document on my desktop. I'm going to go into that folder. Here's the demo live folder. And we've all done this before where we've changed the name of the file to zip. Uh, no, you guys are supposed to tell me you can't do that. The file is locked. It's OK, it's Thursday, I know. So I just, because it's an open office document, I can change it to a zip file. Once I change it to a zip file, I can open it up just like a zip container you normally would. But let's open it up to figure out what actually lives in this spreadsheet that we just opened up. We'll see a folder called Web Extensions. We're going to open up this file. When we open up the Web Extensions folder, it shows us information about the different apps that have been activated and live with this spreadsheet. So the application we built does not get baked into the actual document. The only thing we keep is a reference pointer to the GUIT and the registry store where we acquired the application from. So as we can see here, we have our extension ID that points specifically to the web app. That's the ID that's in the manifest for the web application we acquired. Secondly, we see the store type. So we know that this was acquired from the office store. If it was an application that were in development, the store type would show registry. If it was an application we acquired from an internal SharePoint catalog, it'll point to the internal SharePoint catalog. So you can always go back and see a side to get a much better understanding in terms of how the app was acquired within the enterprise. Secondly, we have this notion of bindings. And bindings exist to give you the ability to say, information that's in the spreadsheet, I'm going to bind my application to it. And a binding, as we know, is a way to move information into and out of something. So this binding created a binding for president. This essentially was bound to the president sheet that we saw. So when information within that sheet changes, so does our UI for an application. Next, we have a binding for Senate. And lastly, we have a binding for poll. But the really interesting piece of information is the app itself does not travel with the document. The only thing that travels with the document is the actual reference pointer. So now let's go in and open up another interesting piece. I'm going to copy this. Go here and paste it.
Another interesting piece for content applications are content applications, every time the end user saves on their desktop, a snapshot image of whatever that application was rendered is taken and stored with the document. The reason for that is there could be instances where an app for Office is associated with a document. It gets opened up within an enterprise, and IT says we don't allow any applications that are acquired from the store to run within our enterprise. And they can do that with some settings that exist from a GPO perspective. When that happens, app for Office, specifically content apps, take a snapshot view of what was rendered within the Office application for your app and stores it as a reference. So if the end user were to activate that application in a closed environment, instead of seeing an error, they would actually just see the last snapshot view of it. That's nice. So as documents roam or as documents leave, if end users, down level users, don't have the ability to light up an app for Office, the example is if it's opened up in Word um, 2010, they would see a screenshot image as opposed to the live document running because down level versions don't support it. So having the capability to represent what was actually rendered within the application while it was running to give end users access to it is pretty convenient. Let's close that. Let's look at one more piece of information. So when we look at this um, relationship file based on the open office um, XML format, it essentially tells us our um, application had one relationship, and that relationship was to that actual PNG file. Every time the end user manipulates the document that causes it to be saved, a PNG screenshot of the app is saved and stored with it as well. All right. Let's have some fun now. So we've looked at, what do we do? We've looked at the app manifest. We know with the Office document, unlike Visto applications, it doesn't live on the client machine. We didn't leave any application bits on the client machine. We store a reference pointer to the app, and we store the catalog where the app was acquired from. Then we store screenshots to support down-level situations in case the application is opened on a device or in an environment where it can't be activated. We don't leave any application code running on the client whatsoever. Now, let's see this web application actually light up and run in the web. So like some of you have or have not, I've just provisioned a new tenant in 0365. This tenant just I created actually yesterday. I'm going to go ahead and move my app for Office Excel spreadsheet up there by dragging and dropping it. Let's take this one. I'm going to take off my Microsoft hat for a second and light things up. And Chrome. So I'm logging into the Chrome, uh, excuse me, my office tenant. I'm going to open up this Excel spreadsheet and Excel web app. And what we'll see here in a second. is it realizes that I've opened up an Excel spreadsheet that has uh, an app for Office in it. And Office gives me this really interesting dialog here that says there's an app associated with this spreadsheet. You're running it remotely. Do you want to execute it? We're going to go ahead and say start. And now it'll actually run that app. And as you see here, here's the same application running that was developed against the Office APIs that can run both on the client as well as on the server. And this is an Office doc. Was there a question? No question. 
So this application still works, function, and behaves with the same bindings that we saw when it was running on the desktop. So here we saw that we have symmetry between a web or office app running on the client as well as it running within Excel web app hosted on, in our SharePoint tenant. So our election tracker, excuse me, our election tracker application gave us the capability to acquire an app from the store, deploy that app within a spreadsheet, render that application on the client as well as on the server. So let's talk about the different user experiences that can be produced. Before we can do that, it's really important that you understand the execution model because the execution model is different from how app for Office get activated on the client from how they actually get activated on the server. On the client, there is, we use the Trident engine to render the Office, um, the app for Office, and that Trident engine is run as a separate independent process that gets lit up the minute you activate an app for Office. So the way it works is I've lit up uh, Word. I haven't actually added any apps for Office yet. When I go to select an app for Office, what happens is a Trident engine gets stood up. The Trident engine is essentially the engine behind IE. IE, as version, uh, I believe, 8 and above, uh, had the ability to run each tab in its own process. So if you guys have ever experienced IE where you've got nine tabs open and it says one couldn't recover, and you notice you don't lose the whole Internet Explorer process, you only lose that tab. That same tabbing mechanism exists to support Apps for Office, and it's supported by the Trident engine. So as an App for Office gets activated, a separate process will be created to support the plum required to have that app be actually piped into the App for Office process to communicate with it. That gives the apps isolation, it gives them resilience, and it gives with the Trident engine, when I start a Trident engine, I have the ability to set some governors. I can set governors around JavaScript. I can set governors around CPU. I can set governors around memory thresholds. So taking advantage of the Trident engine gives apps for Office the ability to make sure that your app runs sandbox, standalone, and it gives it the ability to manage it such that your application doesn't behave in such a way that it takes down or affects the performance of um, an Office client. Next, we move to the web. So on the client, we went from a separate autoproc situation where we essentially just did um, inner process or external process communication. When we move out to the web, Apps for Office are activated in an iframe. And that iframe is supported with the sandbox attribute. So how that gets set up, when we access the um, Excel web app, Excel web app recognized that we had an app for Office in it. It went ahead and loaded and I produced a dynamic iframe, added our location to the start page for our web application as the source for that iframe and it set the sandbox attribute to true. Setting the sandbox attribute to true is important because it down levels some of the functionality that are made available to applications that are running within the browser. This is the paradigm that's followed regardless of if it's Internet Explorer, whether it's Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. As long as the browser supports ECMAScript, it'll have the capability to light up and host an app for Office in it. So we went through a quick demo to show you the symmetry between running it on the client as well as running it on the server. Jump past that one. And we're going to go to the app user experience. First and foremost, when you're building apps for Office, you target capabilities. And those capabilities become key for the next items that we build. We're going to build a mail app. We're going to build a app that's going to target PowerPoint and we'll build an application that's going to target Word. Doing so requires us to have very intimate knowledge in terms of what capabilities that hosting application can provide us. 
So when you're thinking about the applications you're going to build to adorn the documents that it's going to be lit up against, think about targeting those capabilities and writing that code in such a way that your application can be developed for Word or Excel, but if it's opened up accidentally and lit up within, let's say, Project or PowerPoint, it doesn't fail, it just will gracefully exit. And we'll look at a way to provide some graceful exits. Avoid the pitfalls. One important pitfall people should recognize when the app for Office is lit up in a web browser is the JavaScript protocol is not supported. So for those who are used to having um, an href, and within your href, if you say JavaScript colon alert, when that app for Office is lit up in a web browser, those will be completely swallowed by the runtime, and they will not be activated within your document. Secondly, Apps for Office have those governors that I talked about from the Trident engine, and from Outlook, the governors are really controlling. The governors prevent you from writing applications that will impact the performance of Outlook. So we'll look at some examples in terms of the types of governors. The primary one for Outlook is its activation model. When we build an Outlook app, Outlook applications activate based on contextual information that's in the user's view at that point in time. So as an email arrives, or as an appointment arrives, it activates. Once it activates, it gets access to the information within that item, and it needs to be able to make a decision of whether or not it wants to participate in a fixed amount of time. And I'll tell you what those times are and when you could find those values within the registry. Resource awareness is key because you don't have access to the full plethora of the machine that you're running on. The Trident engine will give you some very clear thresholds that exist for alert intervals. These intervals essentially check memory and CPU pressure. And if you've reached a certain threshold for a given amount of time, your application will be gracefully closed. There's no such thing as a graceful close. It'll just close your application. <laughs> right? So uh, be aware of that. Secondly, it's um, from Outlook, you have the ability to write regular expressions against the content of an item. Those regular expressions have a fixed amount of time and a fixed amount of CPU and memory allocation that they're provided. If they exceed those resource governors, your application will be gracefully closed. So be well aware of the different types of resource governors. At the end of my deck, there's a full list to where they're at in the registry, what their default values are, and there are some subtleties that you should point out because regular, the regular expression jitter that exists in the different browsers just behaves differently, primarily between IE and Google. Maybe it's personal. But they, they run regular expressions completely differently, and you need to be aware of that in terms of how much CPU consumption is taken when you try to access a whole body of a message. Um, so we can talk about some of those later on as well. Lastly, crossing app domains. Sometimes you're going to build an application where you will not be able to provide all of the native functionality that's in that app. When that happens, you're going to be dependent on pointing to other applications to satisfy a given need or an end user scenario. When that situation occurs, use app domains as a way to tell the web extensions framework that not only will you be loading resources from your application domain, you will be loading resources from other websites as well. If you don't do that, your application will load those resources in a new browser window. And that's probably not the experience you want to provide. So we'll look at an example of that. And lastly, from an authentication perspective, leverage OAuth as a means to carry authentication information across different boundaries of application and resources you're going to acquire. If, you've, if anyone's run the new Office application, you know in the upper right-hand corner there's some identity there. That identity does not flow through to your application. So if you need identity, identity is the responsibility of your app to acquire, maintain, um, and manipulate as the end user is walking through your app for Office. So it's a really important thing. Most people think that, how come I don't have access to the identity that's on the wire that Office has? Two completely different identities. The identity that's associated with Office is primarily used for acquisition of apps. It's not the execution of them. 
Let's dig into this. All right. Let's see. I'm going to open up. I have one app here. Let's do one for Outlook. So we know I have an app. It is a mail app because we look at the type. Within my app, it's an Outlook phone dialer. So the two apps that I always wanted to build with, there's three. One is if there's a telephone number in the actual email, let me click on it so I can use my soft dialer to dial out. Secondly, if it's a bug number within the email, I like that to be highlighted within my email program because I'm pretty anal about bugs and I like those to be treated somewhat differently. And thirdly, if it's a meeting and I say I'm going to attend the meeting, instead of me having to dial in and remember all the 27 digits to get into the PIN code, just call me on my phone. So those applications were really key to help me optimize my day from the perspective of I don't have to dial into a conference bridge. There's a number there. I can soft dial it and send it to my phone. And three, if it's a bug coming out of TFS or Perforce, it's treated with a different distinction within my mailbox so I know that I can pay attention to it. So this example, I just took the phone dialer one. I have source code for those three other applications. I'll be glad to share them with you towards the end if you get my email address and you can certainly have them. So this is the one that does phone dialing. It essentially will look into the body of a message and it'll say if that message has a telephone number or anything that looks like a telephone number, give it to my application. My application will then interrogate it and make a decision whether or not we'll create a hyperlink to dial out. So here's that icon URL. Again, I wanted to make sure when an end user tries to activate my application, they can get a really pretty icon. I'm going to show you guys just how pretty that icon is because I'm kind of proud of it. It should load pretty quickly. Yeah. That's it. That's all the icon is. It's actually a bit now. Yeah, way to go, right? I did that. I did that. OK, so then we have capabilities. My app is dependent on a host that will give me capabilities to access a mailbox. Now, you guys will all be, guys and gals, will be masters when you leave this session. So mailbox applications follow a different activation path than other apps for Office. Let's talk about that for a second. A mailbox application is acquired by the exchanged administrator and activated and exchanged, and then end users can activate that app in their mailbox as they see fit. So mail apps do not have the ability to let people within the enterprise just go find a mail app and bring it in and associate it with Exchange. Mail applications must be installed by the Exchange administrator, and then the Exchange administrator can activate them across all the mailboxes in that tenant or that instance, or end users can activate the applications individually. So that acquisition process is a little different, but it's really important to understand that from an exchange perspective. So I have a mailbox app. Here's our URL pointing to our VoIP dialer. I'm asserting to the runtime that when my app runs, I want my dimensions to be 150 pixels. I only need to read the contents of the mail item that I get activated on. And lastly, there's this notion of rules. Now, Outlook supports a variety of different item types. It could be an appointment. It could be a contact. It could be a message. Um, it could be a task, et cetera. So I'm only interested in inbound messages that come to my mailbox. And I'm also only interested in whether or not that message has something known as a phone type. This is the really neat part about uh, the new version of Exchange. The new version of Exchange, as items arrive, email items arrive to your mailbox, Exchange will parse that email and identify well-known entities. These well-known entities give you the ability to target them within your application so they activate when your app is running. 
So the entities exist for addresses, there's one for contacts, there's one for telephone numbers. It supports, I believe, a substan all the language packs that are supported by Exchange. So if it's an international telephone number, I'll show you an example, it does actually work. So these well-known entities ship as part of Exchange and they get adorned to your item that exists in your mailbox when Exchange processes that message. So an inbound email comes in, Exchange will process that message find entities that are associated with it, adorn those entity definitions with that message, such that when your mail app is running, it'll look at those entities and say, I only need to activate if I'm a message and you can find a telephone number. If those two things are not true, then do not activate my application because there's nothing that I can provide to the user from a functionality perspective. And that's asserted from this notion of a rules with an and, I want a message, and I want a telephone number. If we scroll over and look at the HTML, in the HTML of the app, uh, we essentially provide a bold link that gives them the ability to click to call, and then we actually process out the telephone number that we found, what's called the dialer holder. So as my app gets activated, I tell App for Office, I know that all my rules have been satisfied. Give me all the telephone numbers in this message. I iterate through all the telephone numbers in the message and just put them right at the very top so I can click on them and soft dial. Yep, good question. So the question is, are those entity types customizable? Meaning, can I create an entity type for Boeing? They have cab cam signatures. Um, you can't customize, you can't create a new entity type. What you can do is you can use regular expressions to accomplish it. So entity type ship is part of Exchange, but you have the capability to create what's called a regular expression, and that regular expression then could process the message for any type of structure you're looking for in content and then activate the message. Let me go ahead and click run on this. If the demo gods are nice, this will work. One important thing to realize is when you're developing mail apps, you need exchange. Where do you find that exchange? Exchange is a very heavy system to set up on your dev box. So what I've done is I just use my O365 tenant, my dev tenant, and I can debug my mail app by provisioning an instance within O365 from a developer perspective and run my app as if I built out completely that environment on my uh, desktop. So I'm going to click sign in. We will sign in to my tenant. So let's zoom out for a second. Let's go 100. So I'm now accessing the OA version of my instance. I'm running from a web browser. You can see I got my first message saying I added an actual user to my account. If I go ahead and click on this message that says call me, I don't know whose telephone number that is, so if you guys try to dial it, you'll be just as surprised as I would be. Um, so, but I clicked on that number. See, there's a number here. If I click on my Outlook phone dialer, all it did was find those telephone numbers that exist within my message, and it gave me the ability to click to call. This is convenient for me because sometimes people will say, give me a call, I have a quick question for you. But that'll be buried in all the other information that they wanted to provide. So I wanted to bring all the telephone and contact information up. So when I click on this, using the new call to protocol, it'll bring up my soft dialer. So now directly from my soft dialer, I was able to use the call to protocol and now I could make a call over link to call whosever telephone number that is. We won't call them. So that's my actual application that's running. Another interesting one that we're going to do is let's send, let's create a new message. And I'm going to send it to myself. Uh, by. And let's do one Microsoft. Way, Redmond, Washington. Uh, 
So now I've just sent the message to myself that just has an address in it. What ships as part of the Exchange uh, 2013 is the ability to have default mail applications that ship with that instance, such that as items arrive that have addresses in them, or that have tasks in them, or that have contact information in them, um, Exchange will essentially say, we have a Bing map application, such that I know that that's an address. So if I click on the Bing map, it thinks it found it. Now it just shows contextually that address information directly within the message so I can quickly find it. The same is true if I were to create an appointment that says, let's meet uh, one, twenty, one, two. You know, at Microsoft, everybody meets at Starbucks. Uh, let's just say, let's add some text. Let me on at Starbucks. So it looks like a regular English sentence. So we will click send. So now what I've done, I just sent the message to myself that someone might say, are you free? Let's meet at Starbucks on the 22nd. If I click on it. See what happens when you do demos live. Let's see, hang on, we might be able to fix this. So um, in Outlook, you can go look at all of the apps that are activated within my mailbox. So as you see here, because we're running within the debugger, it installed my phone dialer. And you notice it says it was installed by user. Uh, and the meeting suggestion one is installed and enabled, so I'm not sure why it did not find that message. Let's see. It should have assumed that it was at midnight at the start of that day. Uh, let's do another one in that time. Let's see. So we'll send that mail to ourselves. Sometimes we do that. Uh, so it should have recognized that it was a meeting, and we should have got the option to add it to our calendar. Fortunately, that didn't work. We can test that, though. So what mail labs give you the ability to do is essentially create applications that activate themselves based on the rules you associate with the message. So I wanted it to be a message, and I wanted it to actually have a telephone number in it. And I really wanted the appointment one to work, but apparently it doesn't. Um, so let's walk through and look at some other types of applications that we can build based on the user experience. I have one more here. This one's called um, Surface Errors. What this app does is it's an Excel application I will give you one important tip if I've been handing those out. Don't use alert as a means to communicate information to your end users um, in your application. Because we know sometimes the alert will not be available to you. So to do that, I created just uh, from the samples. There is a little sample that exists that lets you surface error. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen this one before. So all this application does, and you guys have all seen that. And I don't know what you do after it, but I don't do anything either. But close it. But this gives you the ability to show that an error has occurred and have that alert information spawn natively from your application. And it spawned from the left-hand corner. So it's a nice, convenient way to communicate information to the end user without having to depend on alert. Which 
close this one. I'm going to go to one more. That's interesting. I've created one more application. And this app, I've created to do a couple things. First, sometimes you might create an application that's going to have to access the entire document. An example for that, if you're building a workflow solution that takes an um, expense report, and the contents of that expense report, you wanted to publish to your workflow system that whole document and drive workflow from the approval process. In your app for Office, you're going to need access to that whole document. So I created an application that runs in Word as well as in Excel, but it's context sensitive to those apps. And it'll only light up buttons that expose functionality within those apps such that I don't try to access a spreadsheet when I know that I'm in a document. I don't try to access custom XML when I know I'm running within Excel. So let's walk through and have a quick look at that. I use Knockout.js. Um, so in this example, I've created two, a bunch of properties on my view model. And my view model has a couple properties. The first one is a button that essentially determines whether or not XML capability is available in the app. So when this JavaScript runs, it says, does my host provide access to custom XML? If it does, then I'm going to return true to light up a button. The same is true of file content. Right now, you only have the ability to access file contents for Word documents. You also have the ability to access file contents for um, PowerPoint presentations. When you're accessing that information, you want to make sure only that button exists for those types of hosts. So this one will let us know whether or not I can access the file content. And if I can, then I'll light up that button that gives me access to it, just returning a true or false. And the last two essentially do a prompt to whether or not I can create a binding from a prompt. I know that's only available in Excel. So I check to see if that capability is there. If that capability is there, then I'll show a button. The nice piece about Knockout.js is if you look at my HTML code, all my HTML code has in it is this notion of visible. OK, this notion of visible, which is essentially bound specifically to that compute, uh, that KL.computed uh, member on my view model that'll just change as interactions happen in my document. It'll return true or false. In my HTML code, I just have show button. Same is true for show an async button as well as accessing the file contents. So I have one view model that provides capabilities across the different types of hosts that support information. Let's go ahead and run it. So here's my app running within Excel. I'm going to type in a value here. And now I'm going to add from prompt. I've created now a binding to that value. So if I change this and say, hi, SPC 2012, now you know that value changed. And my app noticed that change and recognized that change and just output it within that, my little status window down below. But now let's run Word for the question the gentleman asked earlier. And let's go insert within Word an Office app. And now you see same HTML, but it notices that I don't have the ability to do anything from a prompt. I only have this notion of XML parts or getting the file contents. So if we get the file contents here, you can see I just encoded, I base64 encoded and show the values, but that's the actual Word document that I'm running in. It's contents, base64 encoded and just output it. Should be base64 encoded. Uh, that definitely doesn't look like base64. I have to figure out what that is. I said it's right. So it's the same code running and supporting both. All right, I'm going to go back. So as we look at it, you can create applications against the different host environments right at once and run it many times and not necessarily have to worry about writing specific code that says if I'm in Excel or if I'm in Word, et cetera. 
Let's talk about the office scenarios. So the office scenarios for Apps for Office are pretty compelling. From a SharePoint-centric perspective, you can use Apps for Office and deploy them with your SharePoint app as document templates such that they light up when they're part of your document library. You also can have them deliver and initiate workflows. You can get the contents of the document that's running, publish it to a SharePoint library on behalf of that user using the uh, CSOM uh, SharePoint APIs and initiate a workflow from collaboration. You also have the ability to do team collaboration. As I'm working on a document, for example, uh, for Boeing, the sample app that I created was, as a mechanical engineer is looking at an IP plan that tells them how to install a certain assembly, if they change the view in that plan, it'll change the instructions that they should be looking at in the Word document for them. So based on the 3D XML camera angle, we can change the instructions that identify how that assembly could be built. So again, that's a word interacting with information that's stored and managed by another system. The last one are document centric. We can do data visualization. There's a gauge one, which uh, I'll show if we have enough time towards the end. You can do reference tools. You can build dashboards. Uh, the gauge tooling that exists now I give you the ability to point to a set of data and you can render that in a really rich and complete way for end users to view. What are some of the key takeaways? First one, apps require capabilities and those capabilities target a specific host. Those are the key pieces of information you want to consider when you're building apps for Office is apps require capabilities that target a host. Also, I can write one app and run it across the variety of different applications that are hosted either on the client or up in the cloud. I can create mailbox-centric applications that are tied specifically to content with, with, that's associated with the message, so it can be contextual. And lastly, I can write that in any technology that's going to accelerate the delivery cycle that I choose fit. So it doesn't have to be written in a specific .NET language. It does not have to be written in a Ruby language. It doesn't have to be written in a Node.js language. It can be written in any language that best supports the environment for you to be productive to meet your objective. Apps for Office, they're a manifest and a web application that gets hosted by the Office runtime. And lastly, the types of apps and what they target. The Excel web app shows an asterisk next to it because task pane applications don't render within Excel web apps. They don't render at all. So use Apps for Office to enrich SharePoint apps and to extend the reach of SharePoint applications that you might be building. Here's a little bit more information that you can gather for building your own Apps for Office. These are the key pieces of information you'll need to move forward. And I am going to end there by saying I ran a little bit over. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being patient. Thank you very much for sitting through this session. Evals are very, very important. Please fill out your uh, evaluations. And uh, my name is Ali Powell, Ali P at Microsoft.com. Enjoy the rest of the session. I wish you all safe travels back home. And